Good evening, everyone. Aloha, welcome. My name is Andrea Nandoskar, and I'm the Education Program Manager at the Historic Hawaii Foundation. And I wanna thank you for joining us this evening for Plants in Place. It's an exploration of native Hawaiian culture, ethnobotany and restoration at Lion Arboretum and a big mahalo to the Harold L. Lion, Harold L. Lion Arboretum, our event partner and education manager, Ray Dal Van Fossen for making this evening possible. Just a few virtual housekeeping items before we begin. Um, and we have a, really a special treat tonight. Um, today's presentation is being recorded. The video will be available on our HHF event webpage tomorrow or early by early next week. Um, and we're also live streaming on Facebook and YouTube. So it will be available there immediately after this evening's presentation. Um, please type your questions as they come up in the chat box on the Zoom menu bar. We had a lot of ground to cover and rather than reserve time at the end for Q&A as we normally do with presentations, our presenters and we have two of them will respond to questions in the chat throughout the presentation. And just to let you know, um, so that you can follow the presentation, even if you do have questions, we will post the full chat transcript on the event webpage after the event. So you can go back and read it and, and don't have to worry too much um, about following that. Um, for those new to Historic Hawaii Foundation, we are a statewide nonprofit that helps people save historic places sites that tell the stories of the multi-layered history of Hawaii. And we do this through education, advocacy, assistance, and protection of and for historic places. I'd now like to warmly introduce our two presenters. Liloa McKinney Dunn is the grounds and collection manager at the Harold L. Lyon Arboretum. He was born and raised in the Ahupua'a of New Valley um, he spent time, uh, some of his, a great deal of his childhood on the islands of Hawaii and Kauai and in his early teens on the island of Huihine, I hope I said that correctly, in French Polynesia. And so his interest in the environment began at a very young age. And it was, he attended college in Oregon and then he returned to Oahu to pursue a BA in Hawaiian studies with an uh, emphasis on the natural environment at UH Manoa and he did enter the graduate school in the ethnobotany program there where he received a master's in botanical sciences. His aloha for our culture and natural environment has guided him to dedicate his life to help preserve these things that are important to him. His academic interest includes Hawaiian and Polynesian ethnobotany with a strong emphasis on Polynesian crop varieties, agricultural systems and traditional ecological knowledge. He is equally interested in Hawaiian and Polynesian native flora and island biogeography and conservation. He will be joined um, during the presentation for part of it by Jesse Adams, who is a research assistant at the Harold L. Lyman, Lyon, the Harold L. Lyon Arboretum, I apologize. His passions include reconstructing plant evolution and biogeography and the conservation of the native flora. Jesse works daily to remove invasive species and curates the 9,427 unique accessions in the Arboretum's living collection. He is currently pursuing a master's degree in botany and has a background in archeology span and zoology. And with that, I welcome Liloa to start us on this wonderful journey. Oh, 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 Kale o hunga ue ue ho nua. Kale o ika na uau. Na ua ho ikala maku kaula na e kapana o kaina loa. Aina ma ili kukahi. Aina kueva. Aina kualii. 
Aino alo i ka malo ku kane loko. Pū ana ki aloha no ku aina. Mano kona ku mau ku. O ahu nui alua ku aina. Ku u hala o ku a mau li ola e. Aloha mai kako. Ah, uh, thank you guys. Uh, that was uh, an oldie mano that was composed by a good friend of ours, Kamuela Makua, who's a Hawaiian language teacher at Anui Nui. So he wrote that oldie specific for Lion Arboretum and for Halo Kumana and our access to the Aihula Malo'i. So um, Andrea was nice enough to introduce me. So. Uh, very quickly, yes, I was born on Oahu, raised in New Valley, spent many years on the island of Huahine in French Polynesia. Got a BA in Hawaiian studies with a concentration in natural environment and a master's in botanical science, uh, where I studied traditional Marquesan plant medicine. I was also a research technician at National Tropical Botanical Garden from 2003 to 2005, uh, working on the floor of the Marquesas project. Uh, I've been with, uh, with Lion Arboretum since 2006, first as the ethnobotanical gardener, then as the interim grounds manager, and now um, the full-blown grounds and collections manager. Uh, aloha kako. Um, I'm Jesse Adams. I'm originally from Black Forest, Colorado. Uh, my family spent many summers here in Hawaii, on Hawaii Island, Kauai, and Maui. Uh, I was originally interested in marine systems, so I went to St. Petersburg, Florida to study marine biology for a bit. And then the whole family, including my grandma, moved to Lihue on the island of Kauai in 2006. Uh, I have a BA in anthropology and zoology. Um, I worked with Dr. Dave Burney at Makawaii Cave on Kauai. Um, following in Liloa's footsteps, you could say, um, I was also a research te uh, technician at National Tropical Botanical Garden from 2012 to 2014. Uh, during that time, I picked up some certificates at Kauai Community College. And I'm currently working on my master's in botany, um, looking at um, evolutionary and biogeographical relationships with Isacne, which is a native grass. Um, I also did a side project on the population genetics of the critically endangered Kauai endemic Palisia spicitenuata. Uh, I've been at the Arboretum since 2018 as a research associate, and uh, I really enjoy science communication, so I'm also a writer for a column in the Star Advertiser, Branches of Botany. Okay, so real quick, we're gonna talk a little bit about the geological formations of uh, Manoa. So Manoa Valley obviously is situated on the leeward flank of the main Ko'olau caldera. It was shaped by erosional forces of gravity, water, and over time the uh, valley widened. Uh, rain captured by the streams carved through the basaltic lava when the Ko'olau's were some 1200 feet higher than they are now. Uh, Manoa, which uh, literally means vast, he rode into this classic amphitheater headed valley that we see today. Other important geological events that helped shape and form Manoa were a series of vent eruptions attributed to rejuvenated stage volcanics that took place between 30,000 and 800,000 years ago, often termed as the Honolulu volcanics. There are nearly 40 of these vents scattered across the coastal er areas between Mokapu and Pearl Harbor, some extended into the ridges of the Ko'olau Mountains. Some of the more famous of these vents are Leahi, or Diamond Head, Ku'uvaina, um, Punchbowl Crater, Alia Pa'akai, Salt Lake Crater, and Kohe Lepe Lepe, or Coco Head. There are three of these vent eruptions that help shape Manoa Valley as we know today. Either are the eruptions of Pu'ukakea, or Sugarloaf, and Pu'uohia, known as Tantlis. Um, in geological circles, this is known as the Sugarloaf system, which dates back between 40,000 and 100,000 years ago. Uh, so along with the Pu'uomano, or Rocky Hill vent, the lava and ash that spread from these eruptions helped to flatten the valley floor 
and push the greater Manoa stream to the eastern side of the valley. These eruptions produced a 10 meter thick lava flow with several meters of ash deposits. The flat valley flora with nutrient rich ash deposits as well as abundance of water from perennial stream provided to be a perfect uh, fit for agricultural development in the valley. This ancient flow would also prove to be a great economic value in the early 20th century as the Mo'ili'ili um, quarry was established, which supplied a lot of rocks for the buildings and roads to grow in Honolulu from about 1889 to uh, 1949. So Manoa Valley is contained within the Manoa Palolo watershed where roughly 16 streams between the two valleys flow into the Alawai Canal. So along with the Makiki watershed, they make up the extensive Alawai watershed complex. Manoa itself has about seven waterfalls and six streams. So there's Aihualama, Vaihinui, Vaihiiki, Lua Alaia, Nania Apo, Wa'aloa, and Vaakea, <coughs> Vaakea Kua. So these all kind of meet downstream and form the, the larger Manoa stream that we know today. So taking a Google Earth image, I um, try to map those names, kind of where those drainages and waterfalls exist today. So you can see that right there. So like all traditional cultures, Hawaiian, Hawaiians had keen observation skills, which they used to help understand and organize their natural environment. Some of these, these rains and winds are named for their physical features, um, as well as uh, names coming from different stories or mo'olelos. Hawaiians had at least five rains specific to Manoa Valley uh, with two other rain names for the general area. So these are kuahine, often you can hear it uh, pronounced tuahine, which is a fine light rain that comes from the Kailua side of the Ko'olaus. There's ku kalahale, which is a passing rain that blows under the eaves of, eaves of houses. Um, Lihe'e lehui, lehua, which is a rain that falls on the lehua flowers. There's the rain called Luahine, which originates in the foothills of the Pali Luahine. And then Wa'ahila, of course, this is uh, named after the ridge for which the rain originates from. Uh, the general rains of the Honolulu uh, Waikiki area, there's two rains called Naulu and Kiovao, and a mist associated with Manoa called uh, Uhibai. We know less of the wind names in Manoa, but I'm sure Hawaiians had just as many wind names as they did rain names. Haukane, of course, is the most famous wind in Manoa Valley. Haukane was Kuahine's husband and father of Kahalaopuna, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Haukane is also the name of a hau tree in Manoa that was known to kani or sing whenever a famed chief passed away. So as I mentioned, to understand the natural world, Hawaiians divided name and organized land, water, and sky into different artificial delineations, streams, ridges, valleys, and forests all had specific names. And sometimes these delineations were based on social, ecological, and social political functions. So an example of that would be the word uh, moku or ahapua'a. We often hear these terms in daily life. An island, of course, is called a mokopuni, and that was divided in a different moku. So Oahu had six moku, so they included Eva, Waianai, Waialua, Ko'olaloa, Ko'olaokoko, and Kona. And further divisions within the moku included Apana, or Okana, or Poko, Ahupua'a, or Ili'aina, and Mo'o'aina. So within the moku of Kona, there are six main Ahupua'a, so they included Moanalua, Kahauiki, Kalihi, Kapalama, Honolulu, Waikiki. The Ahupua'a of Waikiki is probably the most diverse and extensive of all Ahupua'a within this moku. It stretched from Paua to Manalua, so it was rather large. Some people consider Manoa as an Aupua within the greater Konomoku, but I often see it listed as a, actually an Ili of the greater Waikiki Ahupua'a. 
So what is the definition of an ili'aina? According to Pukui, it's a land section next to importance to an ahupua'a and usually a subdivision of an ahupua'a. So there was a map that was done as part of the Hawaiian government survey in 1882 by a survey general, W.D. Alexander, pictured here. And this is a great map. It's loaded with information from place names, geological features, it has land commission awards, as well as various named Ely within the Manoa Valley. So if you look closely at this map, uh, which I did, you can zoom in. Um, and I counted over 40 different Ely names all listed here. So pretty extensive. You guys might be familiar with some of these names like Kane Wai. So two Ely I didn't list on that uh, is Aihu Lama and Haokulu. So these two Ely's are which Lion Arboretum sits in. So I'll talk a little bit more about these Ely later on in the presentation. So with plenty of cool water flowing down from the streams and rich fertile soils, Hawaiians were undoubtedly cultivating lo'i kalo on the flat lower portion of Manoa for at least 800 years, if not more. The population of Manoa Valley was probably in the thousands, at least up until contact when significant depopulation started to take its toll in the mid 1800s. As the economy of the islands changed from subsistence to a market economy, along with changes in the land ownership through the Great Mahele, many Lo'ikalo and Manoa laid fallow. But as Chinese immigrants and others began to arrive in the islands to work sugar plantations, some of, these, uh, some of them adapted the fallow, uh, fallow Lo'i into rice fields. Uh, some Japanese immigrants, uh, it's documented, started cultivating the upper portions of the valley. And it stayed like this uh, pretty much until uh, the early part of the 20th century. The importance of Manoa in early Hawaiian culture is summed up in this Olelo no Eau, Manoa Li'i, Manoa Kanaka, or Manoa of the Chiefs and Manoa of the Commoners. Manoa was divided into Manoa Li'i, which was a land division on the ever western side of the valley. And Manoa Kanako was the land opposite from the valley floor to the eastern side of the valley. Using the old Alexander map that I showed you earlier, I drew a little red line from Pu'u Manoa or Rocky Hill. Some of you guys might be familiar with that right behind Punahou School to Pu'u Luahine, also called Pali Luahine, or Cliff of the Old Woman. So everything above that red line is Manoa Li'i and everything below that Red line was Manoa Kanaka. So we're gonna talk about some various uh, Vahipana Manoa. Um, as I mentioned, um, Pu'uluahini, literally the hill of the old woman. So this Pu'u was actually named after a, a Mo'o Wahine named Luahine who moved here from Ha'ioni ha, ha, with her two sons, Kumana and Paihala. Another important uh, place name is Pu'ahu'ula, literally the feather cloak spring. This was up in uh, Upper Manoa um, near Puka'oma'oma'o. Um, and this was the, the home of Ali'inui, Queen Ka'ahumanu. Uh, and she called her place Puka'oma'oma'o after the green opening um, named after painted green shutters. So she died here around 1832. There's also a mo'olelo that tells us about a famous mo'owahine named Kihanui Lulumoku, who also lived here at Pu'ahu'ula, who could take the form of a human or an eel or a, or a lizard. Through her divine power, it was said that she would make plants thrive in this area. So everyone's familiar with probably Ualaka'a. There's a couple mo'olelo associated with this uh, vahipana. So historically, the mo'olelo of Ualaka'a is credited to Kamehameha for, and his renowned leadership. So Kamehameha had the whole western side of Manoa planted in Uala, 
harvesting these uwalas um, was uh, quite an endeavor. And so you would cut the vines and release the tubers and they would roll down to the bottom. So, and this is where the people kind of collected the tubers and hence the name uwalaka or the, or the rolling sweet potato. Um, there's also uh, another mo'olelo about tumahiai ku, kupehi and kapanaia. So they planted their uwala strips, uh, kupehi on the top of the hill and kapanaia on the bottom of the hill. And they found that these plants would move around. They're wondering what was going on with it. And they finally found out that there was a rat chewing the vine, vines of these uwalas that uh, allowed them to roll down into Kapanaya's patch, patch where they kind of stayed and sprouted. So each of these place names have pretty cool mo'olelos attached to them. Um, Pu'upueo, I've kind of done another Google Earth shot of it, kind of kind of tracked it down, matching it up with the Baldwin map and labeled it right there, as you can see in this photo, Pu'upueo. So this is another Vahipana of Manoa Mano Valley. It's the sacred home of the Awa Amakua, who is also the guardian of the Manoa Princess Kahalaopuna, who we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, Pu'upueo is also mentioned in the story of Kapo'i, who is a faithful owl worshiper who was saved by the wrath of the chief Kakui Heva, who wanted to sac sacrifice Kapo'i for building his own heel for his Pu'upueo uh, Amakua. So Kapo'i was aided by the owl king along with other Pu'upueo and sa saved them from actually being sacrificed from, from Kakui Heva. All right, um, so we're gonna move on to Kuka'o'o Heiau. So Manoa being such a large and heavily populated valley with extensive lo'ikalo throughout the valley floor probably had numerous heiau or religious sites of every category from Luakini to Mapele. Heiau were probably scattered throughout the whole Waikiki, Manoa, Ahupua'a. Uh, Kuka'o'o is probably, I think it is the only intact heiau in Manoa today, and it sits on the site of the Cook family estate named Kuali'i, and both the house and the heiau are uh, on the National Register of Historic Places. Like many heiau, it is said that Kuka'o'o was built by Menahuni when a great battle with the Wahu chief Kuali'i lost possession of it. This heiau was rebuilt by Kuali'i and it's said that Kuka'o actually became the head of a six temple system in the valley. So the quiz essential Mo'olelo of Manoa Valley is the story of Kahala Opuna, the princess who was betrothed to the li'i of Kailua named Kauhi. So unlike other love stories, this was one of jealousy and eventual death. Uh, um, it is a sad story, but there's definitely a lot of lessons to be learned in it. So Kahalo Puna's legendary be beauty caused turmoil between her and her Kane Kauhi, who he eventually kills because of his extreme jealousy. She is brought back to life by her Amakua, the Pueo, who resides in Manoa at Pu'u Pueo. Uh, this happens like five times, and each time she is brought back to life. Um, eventually, Kauhi is put to death for his transgressions and takes the form of his, uh, of his guardian, which is a shark who roams around the waters of Waikiki. Kauhi uh, actually uh, ends up finding Kahalo Puna surfing off Waikiki and finally consumes her, so her Amaku are unable to bring her back to life. And in, in their sorrow, her parents and grandparents give up their human forms and return to Manoa, <laughs> where they live out the rest of their life. Her mother becomes Tuahine, that famous reign of Manoa, and her father, Kahaukane, becomes the wind of the valley. Her grandparents, Aka'aka, Nalehua uh, Nale, uh, o Aka'aka, take the forms of some mountain peaks in the back of the valley, and they all watch over Kahalo Puna, whose form manifests as a rainbow or a nui nui. Another mo'olelo I'd like to talk about is the mo'olelo of the infamous Ava drinking duo gods, Kane and Kanaloa. Uh, their story begins when these Ava thirsty gods travel from the sacred island of Kwahilani in search of good Ava and fresh water. 
As the story goes, whenever Kanaloa was ono for Ava, he would ask Kane to find them fresh water. Kane is always associated with fresh water. So using his o'o, Kane would thrust in the ground and allow this water to bubble up to help them mix their ava. Kane would do this all over the islands, creating springs in every place they traveled. So in Manoa, there are many springs that Kane made, including Kane Wai, uh, where the UH Hawaiian Studies Building is now, where they have some of the lo'i, uh, Punaho, which we're all familiar with, Mo'ili Ili, and uh, Waiakeakua in the back part of Manoa. So we're going to uh, shift gears here now and narrow our focus to the lands where Lion Arboretum now sits. As I mentioned before, part of Lion Arboretum is contained in the Ili of Haukulu, which is intersected by Aihualama Stream to the northeast and the Ili of Puka'o Ma'o Ma'o to the uh, southwest. Haukulu literally means dripping dew. And if you've ever been back here, you'll certainly know that this is definitely a moist area and a very fertile area. So exploring the etymology of the word haukulu, the word hau could refer to the indigenous hau tree or hibiscus tiliaceus, with kulu being defined as a drip or a trickle. So maybe in reference to the way the morning dew collects on the leaves of the hau and drips off to the ground. So under the shadow of the venerable uh, Konohuanui, the history of lion and these lands are tied directly to the people who, who came before them. During the Hawaiian kingdom, Haukulu was part of the Hawaiian government lands and it was actually eventually sold to the father of the future king, William Lunalilo. His name was Charles Kanaina and in 1850, he bought 124 acres in Haukulu for a whopping $250. So Lion currently has about 64 acres that sits in the Ili of Aihualama. But looking at these old maps of Aihualama, it seems to be in what they call a lele of the Ili of Kahao Makaave. This is a, a very interesting way how Hawaiians kind of divided the land. So lele in Hawaii means to jump. So it is used to describe a land section that is not phys physically located within that Ili. So actually the Ili of Kahao Maka'ave is much lower down in the valley of Manoa, closer to Manoa Road and Oahu Ave, kind of near that far away intersection. So what is the etymology behind Aihualama? Well, there's no direct translation, but if you break it up, Ai means to eat, of course. Hua could mean the fruit and Lama, maybe of the Lama tree. So this could be in reference to our native persimmon trees that was you know, a common forest tree of uh, Aiholam and Haukulu. We actually have two endemic llama species that grow in the upper sections of the Arboretum, and those are Diospyros hillebrandii and Diospyros sandwichensis. <clears throat> so bounded by Haukulu to the southwest and Waihi to the northeast, Aiholama, according to the government survey in 1882, was split in half with the lowers being sold to the Honorable Mateo Kekuano Oa, who was a former governor and father to King Kamehameha the fourth and fifth. The upper half, roughly 68 acres, was awarded to this guy named Pahao in the Mahale Land Commission Award number 12. So at this point in the presentation, I'd like to hand it off to my colleague, uh, Jesse Adams. Hey folks, let me get my video on. All right, you can see me. And you can see our office. Um, <laughs> so uh, Liloa, there are a couple of um, questions in the chat that uh, require your expertise. So um, before we talk about the history of the Arboretum, is it important to understand how it came to be? Um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s uh, in Hawaii, uh, the forests were in a state of emergency, but how did this happen? So um, in the mid late, uh, sorry, in the mid to late 1800s, uh, botanists worked to describe the natural environment and flora of Hawaii. Um, so that's what we see going on here. Uh, so this began with the Wilkes expedition, um, which is the United States exploring expedition during the years uh, 1838 through 1842. 
Um, Asa Gray was a prominent botanist uh, on the continent, and uh, he worked to describe a lot of species in a 1854 work. Um, and this was uh, continued um, with the first quote unquote flora, um, which is just a collection of uh, species descriptions and kind of a list of um, plants that are unique to that area or grow in that area. Uh, and this would be the enumeration of plants by uh, Horace Mann Jr. Um, this is in fact uh, the famous Horace Mann's son. Um, he's quite the botanical prodigy. Um, and as we move through the uh, mid to late 1800s, we have lots of other personalities like Heinrich Wara, who was a surgeon in the Hungarian Navy, um, Adolf Engler, uh, who was a German. He was very interested in biogeography. So biogeography, we're looking at um, plants' relationships to each other and kind of inferring based upon those relationships where those plants came from. Um, so this kind of folds into systematics, which is the study of uh, plant lineages, and it also includes um, the naming and description of species. Uh, so it's not really until 1888 with Dr. William Hillebrand um, that we have a true flora of the Hawaiian Islands. Um, we have Joseph Rock, who's another prominent Hawaiian botanist um, with his work, uh, The Indigenous Trees of the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, he did a lot of black and white photos, which was um, kind of revolutionary for the time. And then in 1919, we have uh, Campbell once again looking at um, the relationships between our flora and those found around the world. And um, it, it holds true till this day that a lot of things we have in Hawaii probably have ancestors in Southeast Asia. Uh, so it's widely accepted that things came from Asia to Hawaii, but uh, this is pre-World War II, right? So sonar hasn't been invented. People don't know what plate tectonics are. Um, they don't understand that continents move around. So lots of folks thought that either islands were directly connected to continents and split and kind of floated off into the ocean or almost like a, an Atlantis type concept where you had a land bridge um, that was maybe present during the last ice age when sea levels were lower and then got covered by water or some catastrophe happened and that land bridge broke. Um, so uh, we have lots of folks, they're out there, they're in the forest, they're documenting things and they're denoting, they're noting um, the denuding of the hillsides and the loss of our native flora. Um, and the scientists that are really equipped to answer questions like this are ecologists, right? Uh, these are folks that look at communities of organisms and how they interact with each other, um, how they thrive. So uh, that doesn't really become a field until probably the mid 20th century, really, you know, 1950s, E.O. Wilson. Uh, so the only thing that's close to that at this period in time is pathology. Um, so that's uh, with plants, we're looking at plant diseases, um, the insects or pests that cause them, and then perhaps the environmental conditions that exacerbate them. All right. So um, the kind of the threats to the Hawaiian flora began essentially when humans arrived. Um, it's important to denote that uh, humans around the world have had some type of influence on the natural world. Uh, it's their culture, though, that uh, limits or increases um, the results of their presence, right? So when Hawaiians first arrived to the islands, they probably saw a landscape much like this. Um, this is an illustration of Makawai Cave on the south shore of Kauai. This is past the Hyatt if you go down the dirt road. Um, highly recommended. It's a really cool area. And uh, using um, archaeological techniques, they did excavations in there and found all these fossilized bones of um, these huge, uh, I guess you would say like a geese you wouldn't want to meet, a goose rather you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley, you know, six foot tall waterfowl with an attitude. Um, but these really big moanalo. Uh, and they were um, vegetarians browsing on all the plants that were around in the area. Uh, so you can imagine um, if you're a person and you arrive somewhere and there's these large birds that aren't really afraid of humans, um, they're probably going to be eaten rather quickly. <laughs> and that's what happened. We see these uh, large birds die out pretty rapidly after uh, humans arrive. 
Um, there's a lot of other uh, birds that went extinct, but I really want to highlight this stilt owl, this Graustrix auceps, um, just because it's a really fun word to say. And um, it's also just a cool bird. It's a daytime owl that had really long legs that would hunt other birds. So it's kind of fulfilling the role of like um, a falcon, an eo, um, you know, a bird of prey. So that was pretty cool. Um, one thing that the Hawaiians brought with them that was probably not an intentional introduction was rats. Um, this is Rattus exelons. Um, this is not really like your typical, what you would think of when you think of a rat, it's more the size of a mouse, um, quite cute, but really has a penchant for eating um, Petrardia or Lolu. You can see those fan palms in the illustration. Um, really loves to eat their seeds. So this probably had some effect on regeneration of certain plants in the forest. Okay, so uh, moving on, um, Hawaiians brought with them this transported landscape uh, as Polynesians moved across the Pacific. I'm sure that they noted most of the islands they went to, uh, they didn't have plants required uh, to survive, either for medicines, um, tools they needed, or more importantly, food. So um, they needed to transform certain lowland areas uh, to grow food, have agricultural systems. Um, so evidence of this is seen at Ordi Pond in the Eva Plain of Oahu and Makawahi Cave on Kauai. Uh, they took really um, deep pollen cores. Um, so just go in, take a core sample of dirt, and then you can look at fossilized pollen grains and you can infer when they kind of phase out that that species goes extinct. Um, and you could also kind of infer um, uh, like levels of uh, presence of those species. So um, this is a great graphic that's on the right-hand side of the slide. This is from uh, Gone et al. 2018. You can see the um, uh, publication right there if you want to read it in depth. But uh, pre-contact, um, you can see Hawaiians had very little footprint on the islands. Post-contact, my goodness, 83% of the island is uh, influenced by humans. So some other things that Hawaiians brought with them uh, that could be considered invasive or had an impact on the ecosystem is Aurites molecana, that's kukui nut, um, and hibiscus tiliaceus or howl. Uh, it's my personal opinion that um, nowadays there's probably not the harvesting pressure being exerted on these plants. So uh, they're just kind of really thriving. And when you look up the mountains, you can see the kukui nuts, the silver sheen, and then kind of the lower areas, you can see a lot of howl growing. Um, they also brought pigs with them, probably didn't have as much damage as European pigs. And then um, some of the crops they brought, undoubtedly there were probably some weeds that came with them. Um, we can assume that these were mainly confined to agricultural areas. Okay, so we really see the uptake in, uh, rather the uptick in uh, changes to the environment happening when Europeans arrive. Uh, with their culture, they're going to introduce um, cows. That's both Taurus. This was done by Captain Vancouver in 1973. Um, we have goats, Caprahercus, um, two separate introductions by Cook in Vancouver. Um, Quivis Aries, that's sheep. Um, those are introduced in 1791. And then we have a whole slew of rat species. So this would be like your classic Norwegian black rat, you know, something that's kind of big and scary and you don't want to see. Uh, also, they brought a lot of boring insects. Um, so these would be insects, twig borers that go into trees and kill them eventually. So looking at the photos here, um, the large uh, kind of dead tree that's on the left-hand side, that's a flugia. And that would be considered kind of the monarch of the forest. It's like the Hawaiian equivalent of a redwood, just this huge, massive tree, really beautiful, but they're dying out because uh, twig borers really like them. And then also, if we look at that photo in the lower right-hand corner, um, we see the sheep. And this is on the side of Mauna Kea. Uh, notice how there's just kind of just a couple of trees hanging on and there's not really much else. Um, as we all know, uh, goats and sheep are really good at grazing everything down to the dirt. And that's kind of what happened. So um, another thing uh, that drove this change after Westerners arrived was commerce, making money. So we have sandalwood harvesting, we have pulu harvesting. Pulu is that really soft hairs that are on um, some of the native cybodium ferns, the hapu'u. 
Um, there's lots of ranching and then there's production agriculture that's going on. So just vast swaths of land being put into production for sugarcane, pineapple, uh, other crops like that. Um, so this slide is just a bunch of pictures of um, kind of the destruction that was happening at that time. Uh, so on the left hand side, we see native forests um, that have either been impacted by grazing animals or in the lower left hand corner, that's actually a housing site on Maui. If we move to the center, um, the top photo is a picture from the Waimanalo plantation. Um, so you can see really just sugarcane as far as the eye can see up until the mountains. And then um, that lower photo in the middle is really interesting. That's a fence, right? So you can see on the left-hand side of the fence where they're allowing grazing, um, there's no understory. There's really no regeneration of native species. It's all like really big trees. We're not seeing any small trees or anything. On the other side of the fence that's protected though, we see just very vigorous undergrowth. Um, and it looks like a healthy forest. So uh, in areas where they were allowing cattle to go, allowing sheep, goats, other things in there, um, we ultimately see on the right-hand side of the slide, just the forest totally being destroyed. These larger trees just really hanging on until the very bitter end uh, when they phase out. Okay, so it became quite apparent to everyone, especially business folk at this time, like, hey, um, we got a watershed issue going on. We need to make sure that uh, our mountains have forests on them. Um, they kind of connected forests to holding water. So after a rain event, the forest kind of helped to slow the water down and let it percolate into the aquifer instead of just running off the land into the ocean. Um, so we have, uh, I promised Lilo I'd only do one meme in this presentation. <laughs> so it's on the left-hand side right there. But yeah, folks just wanting to get on board with conservation of forests um, related to a loss of water. Cool. So um, this is a quote from uh, this book right here. It's really excellent. Um, some of you might not realize, but here at the Arboretum, we have a non-lending library. Um, so that's just a fancy way of saying if you want to come up here and read a book while we're open, uh, you're more than welcome to come check us out. We have a lot of titles. Um, but the quote from there is big business, at least and at last, saw the value of conservation when loss of water resources threatened the economy. And from that book also, we want to remember Hawaii's environmental problems are often urgent and usually complex. All right, so into this enters Lyon. Uh, Dr. Lyon was born on October 14th, 1879 in Minnesota. Uh, he lived there until about 1900. Um, he did a brief stint in Vancouver for a summer job. Uh, he came back to Minnesota and ultimately received a PhD in 1902 from the university there. Um, and he taught for a bit. Um, and curiously enough, in 1905, he married one of his students, Maud. Um, you can see her on the far right side. And uh, they were quite the um, dynamic botanical duo, you could say, um, both really into plants, loved working together, loved being outside. Uh, and it's also very cool to note that Maud, um, as a woman in the early 1900s, had a bachelor's degree in botany. So at the request of the Hawaii Sugarcane Planters Association, uh, Harold Lyon moves uh, out to the islands in 1907 um, he's the assistant plant pathologist, and he's working on sugarcane diseases. Um, so they're trying to formulate different cultivars of sugarcane. They're bringing in things from um, Southeast Asia and other parts of the world um, to create these cultivars. And along with that, they're bringing pests in. Um, and these could be insects or diseases. So Lyon's working on that. Uh, in his personal life, uh, Lyon's really interested in orchids. And um, if you guys are familiar with the orchid house at Foster Botanic Garden, a lot of the original orchids there um, are from Lyon. Uh, it's a new fact that I didn't know about him. So, and also uh, Lyon and uh, Harold rather and Maud were very, uh, you know, active in the community. Um, they were part of Red Cross. So we actually went through some of the Lyon memorabilia and we found his Red Cross certificate. Um, he was also a Freemason, so we have his Mason membership card right here, which is pretty cool. 
And then um, as part of lots of other organizations, professional organizations, including um, AAAS, which uh, still functions to today, that's the American Academy of the Sciences. Um, so you have some cool badges here. Uh, he was also um, kind of integral in helping to found the Hawaii Botanical Society, which is still active till today. And uh, just a fun factoid about Lyon, um, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, uh, he was the only person that had Baker's yeast. So he actually supplied uh, the entirety of Oahu with Baker's yeast. Cool. So um, Lyon really starts to look at uh, the forests and the state they're in in 1907. Um, he had been corresponding with H.P. Baldwin, who invited him out to East Maui, the Ko'olau district, um, to see what was going on. And they were noticing this trend of trees dying, undergrowth dying, and then the undergrowth regenerating, um, which we can now say today, well, you know, that makes sense. That's a su successional stage, right? Um, but at that time, it was a bit of a mystery. So in 1908, he visits the area. And uh, I highly recommend that everybody check out the Hawaii Planters record. Um, it's a really uh, interesting publication. Um, got everything from the utility of steam engines to uh, reports on the forests in there. It's, it's a good read. Uh, so some quotes from there. Uh, from the beginning of the investigations, it was evident that the source of the trouble was in the roots. So remembering Lyon is a pathologist. He's not an ecologist. So he's looking at the roots. He's noting um, that uh, there's no like real fibrous roots, it's kind of just tap roots. Also, um, a lot of the trees are stunted. And uh, then he looks at the soil and he notes that um, the soil is sour, waterlogged. And um, he feels that really there needs to be drains installed in these areas to help drain the soil because uh, he feels that everything is uh, really wet. Um, so curiously enough, uh, he kind of throws his hands up in the air and he says, we've got to introduce exotic trees. The reason he does that is because he feels it's not economically feasible to drain these lands. Um, you could tell he's into orchids because he mentions that if the trees supported orchids, he might consider doing it. But since they're just trees, that wasn't the case. Okay, so in 1918, um, he kind of uh, he's doing more investigations, looking at more forests, and he just really comes to the conclusion that our native forests are doomed. Um, he thought they were derived from an ancient flora. Uh, remember I had mentioned that people thought that Hawaii was attached to a continent, so he assumed that, uh, you know, long ago in antiquity that uh, it was a, Hawaii was attached to Asia, and that since it had not been infused um, with vigor from uh, plants in Asia or elsewhere, that this was kind of a, a dying flora, um, which is really uh, not the right conclusion to draw from that. Um, so he also keeps on bringing up this reoccurring theme of limited time and limited money. So uh, within the Hawaii Planters record, um, there's kind of this dialogue between him and W.M. Jaffard uh, going back and forth, uh, um, Lion is advocating the use of non-native species. Jafard is saying, well, we should really use um, indigenous species. And I think really Lion probably did not know how diverse our forests were. Um, currently, there's about 1,400 different species in our flora, which is really phenomenal. Uh, and also, he didn't recognize recruitment of weeds as an issue. Um, Jafard writes a lot about how helo grass is creeping into the forest and it's concerning because he feels it's actually the helo grass and other invasive species that are not allowing the native plants to regenerate. Doesn't have anything to do with their vigor or anything. Um, what Lyon did notice and was appropriate and good is he saw the benefits of fencing areas. So if we look at this um, aerial photo from Google Earth, uh, this is actually on Maui. This is the Oahe Forest Reserve. I um, highly recommend that you guys volunteer with them if you're ever on Maui. It's just a really cool um, story and just phenomenal to see how putting up a fence and doing outplanting, you can actually get native stands of forest. Um, so those native stands are the uh, dark green boxes um, and you can have an impact that's visible from space. That's really cool. 
So um, he also, Lyon that is, understood the importance of protecting intact forests. Um, he did not advocate uh, commercial ventures going into the forest um, or kind of uh, trails being expanded, roads being put in. He didn't want any of that happening in intact forests. Um, he understood that diverse forests are healthy forests and that's really important. So um, even though he wanted this alien landscape, he knew I need trees, I need shrubs, I need herbs, I need vines, um, I need mosses, I need ferns, I need all these things. So um, he's kind of tapping into kind of that ecosystem concept, that ecology concept. Uh, and then just a fun factoid I thought was interesting is he thought Aluhe, that's Dichronopteris linearis. So if we all were looking out at the mountains, um, you notice there's kind of that light green band that's maybe halfway to the top of the mountains. That's all fern. Um, and it's really, it's, it's quite a sight to see. But um, he thought it was a weed because in disturbed areas, it was the first thing to move in. And he also deemed it as kind of a fire risk. Cool, so uh, moving on to the rise of lion. So in 1910, he travels throughout the Orient and the South Pacific to study cane diseases. In 1908 to 1918, he's appointed as the head of the Department of Plant Pathology. Um, in addition to focusing on sugar cane, he's also looking at pineapple diseases. And there were apparently issues with the canning process, uh, making sure that the pineapple was preserved. So he worked through that. Uh, in 1918, um, everybody is getting really worried about the forests and the state of Hawaii kind of acknowledges that they don't have the expertise or at that time it would have been the territory, uh, that they didn't have the expertise uh, to handle this. They really needed a botanist. So um, the Sugarcane Planters Association said, well, we have this fantastic botanist and uh, they put their heads together and they formed the Department of Botany and Forestry and appointed uh, Lion as the head. So in 1918, he begins his reforestation project. Um, he leases land from Mary E. Foster, what is now Foster Botanical Garden. And uh, before that, it was the William Hillebrand residence. Um, he leases that area and some adjoining plots where he sets up a nursery. Um, but he knows, uh, and he's also a frugal minded guy that some of the plants that he collected will not make it. So he really wants to do field trials um, so in 1919, the HSPA acquires 124 acres in Upper Manoa Valley. Uh, as Liloa mentioned, and as you saw from a lot of the maps and um, the aerial imagery and whatnot, it's quite steep in these areas. Uh, so he wanted more land that was flatter that he could conduct these trials on. Uh, so he talks to the neighbors of this plot, um, which would be the Bernice P. Bishop estate and the territorial governor, George R. Carter. Um, they uh, say, yes, we'll lease you additional lands for a nominal fee. So the research station now um, expands to 420 acres uh, with 120 acres that are suitable for these garden trials. Uh, Lyon, during his travels, he collected his own material, but he also um, built a lot of connections with botanists all over and he had them send him seeds. So he collects a whopping 8,000 seeds. Um, or sorry, 8,000 species, which is like, that's crazy. That's a ton of species. And he really had a penchant for figs. Uh, the reason he liked figs is um, they're very good at holding the land and they didn't really have any value for folks at that time. So um, he was kind of concerned about people, you know, he plants these trees and then folks are gonna come in and harvest them for timber. Uh, wasn't really the case um, with figs. So an important thing that everyone needs to know about figs and their biology is they have a symbiotic relationship um, with wasps. So they depend on these particular species of wasps for their pollination. Um, and without them, they won't set viable seed. So uh, Lion had some entomologist friends that worked for the HSPA and they introduced two species of these pollinating wasps. Um, I really think it's quite fortunate that uh, more wasps were not introduced and that more figs were not introduced um, because that could become a serious problem for us today uh, in our native forests. Uh, according to our records, um, he starts planting up here at the Arboretum in 1920. 
And um, throughout this time, he's making numerous collection trips, um, just getting more and more seeds for his project. All right. So um, kind of moving through the test phase, uh, he um, advocates for a botanical garden in Honolulu. So in 1953, the HSPA gives the 124 acres to um, the University of Hawaii. And uh, really, Lyon, in an article entitled uh, Honolulu Can Have a Botanic Garden, lays out, um, he sees a network of gardens with um, the Honolulu Botanic Gardens, Foster, Cocoa Head, all those guys, uh, working with the Arboretum. Um, he sees it really as a nexus of research to be used by students and faculty of the university. Um, publications, uh, we have our own publication called Leonia. And also, um, he really advocates for a herbarium, which is a collection of dried press plant specimens. Um, we used to have our own, now it's part of the one that's on campus. And on May 22nd, 1957, the UH Board of Regents renames the Manoa Arboretum as the Harold L. Lyon Arboretum. Okay, so um, moving really quickly through uh, that time until now, um, we've had a lot of collections managers. Uh, one of them was Don Anderson. I uh, really had a passion for Kahlo. Uh, he worked here from 1956 to 1972. Um, our great lawn area all used to be Kahlo. Um, he had the largest collection in Hawaii, 160 varieties with 56 unique to Hawaii. Um, many of these have been transferred to the micropropagation lab. Uh, he's followed by Bob Hirano, who managed the collection from 1964 to 73. His interests were in plant breeding, so he's creating ornamental plants, um, those that are preferably sterile so that they wouldn't move into our native forests. So he's looking at calatheas, um, zingibers, that's just a fancy way of saying gingers and heliconias, um, vireas, which is that uh, plant that's in the lower left-hand corner, it's a rhododendron, um, cordylines, your teas, different types of sandalwood, and the warswitzia, um, which is that beautiful red, massive red flowers there. Uh, he also made a lot of checklists for plants at the Arboretum. Uh, the grounds director preceding Liloa was Ray Baker. He managed the collection from 1973 to 2011. Um, he worked his way up from student worker to grounds manager. He was a palm expert. Um, he built our collection to about 810 unique taxa, um, which probably qualifies us as the world's largest collection of palm trees. Uh, he co personally collected 34 from South America and he taught a palm course at um, University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, he also expanded the zingiberales, so once again, your heliconias, bananas, gingers, things like that. And uh, he really worked to document the collection. Um, so mapping things, taking copious notes, all of that. Um, so the state of our um, plants, the state of our collection right now is we have 17,230 living plants. Um, these are from 233 families. Most are pan-tropical, so that's anywhere in the tropics around the world. They represent about 5,660 unique taxa. So um, 2020 was really a year of growth for us. I know it, it was um, devastating with COVID but we added 334 new accessions and we outplanted 2,103 plants. So we were really taking care of business up here. Um, so one of the uh, projects that I work on is removing invasive species. So uh, since Lyon was really kind of uh, getting a short list of plants that grow quickly, um, he was in many ways cherry picking really good invasive species. Um, so working with the Hawaii Pacific weed, weed Risk Assessment, which is a protocol used to determine if plants are invasive or not, um, we've identified many of these as invasive. Uh, currently, our target species list, we're working on Angiopteris evecta, mule's foot fern. Um, so that's me dropping the shaka on the right-hand side, taking one of those out. Um, Falcataria molicana, that's albizia. You can see that in the upper left-hand photo. Um, it's pretty cool, we just use a drill um, and a very small amount of herbicide to take down this massive tree. Um, so really great technique for that. And for both of those projects, we're partnered with KMWP, that's the Kolau Mountain Watershed uh, Program. Um, so they manage the watershed for the entire Kolau Mountains. Um, also, we work on Scytherexalum caudatum. This is fiddlewood. 
Um, I've heard from some people this was Mufi's favorite too, I'm not really sure. Uh, also, we're looking at our DZ elliptica. Um, we're taking out a Ringa pinata. That's that lower left-hand photo of me with the massive drill. Um, in Java, these are really bad for rhinos because they create an intense amount of shade and they just shade out everything that the rhino likes to eat. Um, so I was able to get some, uh, you know, in-depth knowledge on how they treat the Orangas from that group and we're applying those techniques here. Um, we're also taking out various Ericaceae, Ericaceae or palms, and then various melastomes. So that's going to be like your Clydemia, your Tibicinas, Myconias, all the, you know, classic bad guys. And we do work with HDOA and OIS, which is um, the Oahu Invasive Species Committee, HDOA's uh, Hawaii Department of Agriculture. Um, we do manage a very small um, inner situ restoration site or Haupulu restoration site. Uh, this is a partnership with DLNR DOFA and PEP, that's the Plant Extinction Prevention Program. Um, so they're working with plants where there's 50 or fewer individuals in the wild. So these are like really on the brink of extinction. Um, so I feel, uh, as I'm sure everyone else at the Arboretum, just uh, immensely honored to be able to work with Sertandra Kalantha. Um, you can see that in the lower left-hand photo. Um, it's related to African violets, just really beautiful plant. And um, this started as a, a master's project. Um, Pia Ruisi Basares, uh, who was a botanic gardener before me, um, was looking at uh, this species. And we've just continued on with her planting um, of uh, the Calanthas and then working um, with our partners at DOFA and at PEP. Uh, finally, um, we're working on a palm revitalization project. Uh, why do we do palms? Um, because in, you know, throughout the history of the Arboretum, we've only lost about 10% of our palm collection, which is, that's phenomenal for a hundred years. Um, so that means palms do really well here. They really like it. So it's going to be a three-year project. We're going to start off with inventory and planning. Um, we want to build some collaborations with other botanic gardens that have large palm collections. Second year is going to be fundraising. And third year is going to be collection trips. We really want to get wild collected things. Um, and the goal is to have the world's largest curated palm collection with a focus on native species and endangered taxa worldwide. All right, so at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Liloa. Okay, guys, thanks for uh, staying with us. I know we're going over time a little bit here, but I really want to just quickly go over um, some of these last slides, specifically uh, stuff that we do in the Beatrice Krause uh, Hawaiian at the Botanical Garden, which is um, probably the flagship garden of the Lion Arboretum. Uh, so the role of the Hawaiian at the Botanical Garden, um, we have a collection of native plants, plants introduced by original Polynesian settlers, we call canoe plants and modern day uh, introductions. Um, essentially, what we do in this garden is conserve both the biological and cultural heritage of these uh, of the islands with our plant collection through interpretation, education, and volunteerism. Uh, we've done a lot of projects. We have a La'au Lapa'au uh, garden that I created under the tutelage of Kumu Laban Ohai. So uh, yeah, this uh, medicinal garden was uh, created to kind of showcase the wide range of plants that were used in Hawaiian medicine. Um, I studied Hawaiian plant medicine under Kumu Laban Ohai right here pictured there on the left. So he often called healing plants warriors and he incorporated common Hanai plants like aloe or comfrey because of their efficacy in curing illness. Uh, traditional Hawaiian medicine so what, this, what he taught me and what I see a lot in the Pacific and in Polynesia is that traditional medicine is not something that just took place in the past, but it's rather it's an, uh, something that is evolving, that incorporates new plants and new ideas to help heal the body. I uh, went through um, a couple of uh, la'au plants we have in the garden, including uhaloa, uh, koko'olau. Um, Ava, which is a, a Polynesian introduced plant, some Olena, and really I apologize, I'd like to get more in depth on these plants, but we really need to wrap it up here. Um, Kihapai, 
Pohecula. Both are modern introduced plants. So one of the first big uh, projects I tackled as the botanical garden was to build a traditional meeting house or Hale Halavai. So this would serve as uh, this Hale would serve as a standing example of the very concept of ethnobotany, and it would also serve as an outdoor classroom for workshops for the students of uh, Halal Kumana and others. Uh, we worked with uh, Kumu Francis. Uh, Polani Sinensi secured funding from HTA Atherton and Friends of Lion Arboretum. Uh, we planned and executed community workshops from November 2010 to 2011. Um, first thing we need to do is site location and preparation. Here's a few of us looking at the site. Uh, next, we had to uh, procure the, the material. So I went to the Big Island. This is obviously uh, before Rod and some other things uh, to go collect Ohia Lehua, uh, an endemic tree from the Big Island. So this would serve as the Po and the Po Manu. I'll get to that later. We also repurposed uh, naturalized and invasive species in this Hale project. One of them was mangrove. The other one was the shoe button Ardesia. Um, our Ardesia elliptica, which is naturalized and uh, runs rampant throughout the Arboretum. Uh, we also, uh, for the thatching, we used uh, a naturalized uh, fan palm, Chinese fan palm, the Vistona chinensis. We also used both uh, native and non-native Pracharia species found around lion in the Arboretum. Material preparation, uh, we soak all this wood uh, in uh, the fish pond at Pai Pai Oheia for a couple months. Um, and our first, our first community workshop was the Umuhao Pohaku workshop. So this was a rock uh, building workshop that took place for two days in November, 2010. Uh, we then erected the poles. These are the ones made out of Ohia Lehua right here, um, setting the wall posts and the corner posts. Uh, in order for us to be construction, uh, begin construction on the main structure, we had to build a scaffolding inside the rock wall. Uh, this is called the Olakea. So there's a picture of the Olakea with inside the future structure of the Hale. Uh, during this stage of construction, the main rafters and purlines were fixed to the posts. Uh, the last main structural component to be secured was the Pomanu or center prop. Traditionally, the Pomanu required a blessing and sacrifice. Uh, depending on who the hale was for and what the function was, a sacrifice could be a person or a substitute, often an alua fish. For this blessing, uh, we used the fish. Setting the pomanu. And phase four was thatching. I didn't say this earlier, but we collected over 3,500 uh, leaves to thatch this hale. Some pictures of the thatching of the hale. As we move, the final day and blessing was a, a great day. Unfortunately, um, we've had to remove this hale uh, a few years ago because uh, basically hales of this size probably were not built this far back in the valley. Um, so uh, we are planning to rebuild this hale uh, this summer. So we've already procured all the materials necessary for that to happen. And again, we're gonna open that up um, to the community to help us out. Uh, quickly again, uh, the Aihulama uh, restoration. So there's an old Lo'i system across the street, uh, across the stream and uh, from Aihulama stream. So we've been uh, working with Halau Kumana to rebuild uh, this ancient Lo'i system. We had a community work day with Onipa'a Nahui Kalo to restore um, like uh, pretty much we opened up four more Lo'i in that area. Moving quickly again, here's some pictures of us working. So um, lastly, I just wanna talk really quickly about our native plant restoration uh, work here up at the Arboretum. Uh, Jesse talked a little bit about the inter C2 site with Sir Tandra Kalanta, but yeah, my vision for our living collection, I kind of want to shift that paradigm to better reflect uh, some of the changes we see both on the local and global stage in terms of biocultural conservation, 
sustainability research um, in the face of global warming, plant extinction, and cultural knowledge loss. So I see Lion Arboretum as an XC2 conservation zone for other endangered taxa and biological hotspots with similar tropical and subtropical uh, ha habitats with a special focus on the Polynesian, Micronesian biodiversity hotspot. Uh, the Arboretum also has many pockets of remnant native forests existing on the grounds and we've been identifying these areas and taking proper management uh, steps and actions to preserve and ex expand our native footprint. Uh, we have native plants in the new Hawaiian garden, uh, the Hawaiian at the botanical garden, and also our main uh, um, Hawaiian section in H34. Again, you know, I, I'm really sorry that we had to uh, rush all this, but um, we've been, uh, I've been working in the Hawaiian section probably for the last 10 years and have planted over a thousand native species up in that area. So um, there have been many employees and student workers and volunteers that came before me to help maintain the uh, lower plant section. Um, but my whole goal is the upper Hawaiian section. So um, we're really gonna do uh, what I uh, talk about is um, doing uh, planting existing native plant communities that are found within the Arboretum and the Manoa Cliffs area, um, focusing on the Ko'olau native communities like the Ko'a Mesic Forest and the Ohia Lowland Wet Forest, with Ko'a and Ohia being the keystone species. So yeah, the end goals of this section is to have a highly diverse self-sustaining native forest that has been restored to its former self. Um, again, Sorry for going over and sorry for rushing some of the good stuff, but I'd like to uh, uh, mahalo Andrea, Historic Hawaii Foundation, Lion Arboretum donors and volunteer, Tim Krosig for a lot of the images. And if you wanna get involved, please come check out uh, our website uh, for volunteering opportunities and donor opportunities. Mahalo Nui. <laughs> Jesse and Liloa, thank you so much. Um, wow, what a wonderful presentation. And thank you to everyone who stuck around and those who didn't, you can come let them know they can come back and watch the part they may have missed. It's just such a rich place. Really wanna thank you so much, uh, Lilo and Jesse and, and the Arboretum. Thank you for sharing your mana'o this evening. To our audience, um, we hope you enjoyed this evening. And I also want to thank my colleague, Michelle Kisek for helping provide technical support and let everyone know if you would like to support HHF and our work, please go to historichawaii.org and the join us section. And tomorrow um, we are having the, I think it's the fourth lecture in the experts lecture series, which, is, which will be Ron Williams Jr., um, Jr. who will present the changing Lahaina historic district with a focus on Moku'ula, the royal compound in Lahaina, and you can register for free at historichawaii.org. Want to wish everyone a wonderful rest of your evening. If you have not visited Lion Arboretum, highly encourage you to visit their website and see the opportunities that you can do once you're there visiting, maybe volunteering. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate your time. Have a wonderful evening.